Now, welcome to our annual members meeting. It's great that you're here and you join us on our MS Teams event. We are holding this annual members meeting slightly later than normally than we normally do. Um, it's just one of those things. COVID's impacted on us again this year, and so dates are slightly shuffled. But what we're going to be doing tonight is looking at the activities that we've been involved in for the financial year 2020 to 2021. So that's running up to the end of March this year. Today, we're also going to launch our annual report covering that time frame. And we've got a range of speakers. Our speakers are Alan Lockwood, our chairman, Catherine Singh, our chief executive, Ian Carell, our new, fairly new finance director. I think Ian's been with us about eight weeks now. And also Philip Gowland, who looks after our governor's members, FT members, and is our corporate assurance director. So I welcome all of those to this event too. So what we'll do straight away, we will go over to Alan Lockwood, our chairman. Uh, welcome, Alan, and over to you. Lynn, thank you so much, and thank you for that uh, great build-up. Uh, I'm delighted to see the numbers are slowly creeping up, and welcome to you all uh, to our annual members meeting. Um, I'm not going to go into a prolonged welcome um, because uh, there's a lots of really important information coming up, um, but I just wanted to say a few words of thank you, really. Um, as you will all know from the press, from your own experiences and what life has been like for us in the last 12 to 18 months, uh, how much we are indebted to the staff in the NHS. And I'd like to pay a great tribute to our own staff in our dash for all the hard work and effort they've put in. It has not been easy and it may seem at times that we at the very top underappreciate you. We do not indeed. We are mindful of what you go through every day, even still as this hopeful this pandemic is receding, working conditions are still difficult for you and we know and understand that and we appreciate everything you do. I would really like publicly also to thank the Board of Directors of R Dash uh, for their hard work over the last 20 months. It's not been easy working uh, as a Board of Directors remotely, trying to manage the trust that we so dearly love, but I'd particularly like to pay tribute to the executive directors and the hard work that they have had running and managing the trust as has been necessary through this pandemic. In particular, I'd like to pay tribute to Tracy, uh, our uh, director of nursing and uh, 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 sorry, other healthcare professionals who did the gold command uh, lead for so long uh, under difficult and uh, very trying circumstances. A special thank you to you and also to Catherine, our CEO, whose leadership has been exceptional throughout. And a final thank you to our members and the members of the public. I have to say that people don't really understand that it's actually through the hard efforts of you complying with the laws and legislations that came down from government that meant that we we're actually to get ourselves into the safe position we are today. I encourage you to take the vaccination if you haven't. Uh, I go for my booster tomorrow. Told you that I'm an old bloke, doesn't it? Um, but I do say it's through the public that have made the success of the vaccination programme and the eradication, hopefully, of this nasty pandemic uh, eventually will come through to fruition. So without further ado, uh, I'd just like to say welcome, enjoy this afternoon uh, and uh, the uh, information we're going to give you. Please do ask questions if you'd like to, uh, and we will try and answer them. Uh, if Particularly if there's been stuff about to today, then we probably will. But I do say if we can't, we will get back to you with an answer as soon as we can. So without more ado, back to you, Lynn, and welcome once again, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Now, somebody's already said that we've no agenda tonight. So what I'll do, I'll run through the running order. And that is basically the agenda. So we've just had Alan to welcome us. Next up in the hot seat will be Catherine Singh, our chief executive. And Catherine's going to talk about our year. Following Catherine will be Ian Carell, our finance director. who will talk us through the finances for 2020 to 2021. That will be followed by Phil Gowland, our Corporate <laughs> Assurance Director, who will talk about governors, members, the board and so on. And that will then be followed by Catherine Singh again, who will look to the future. It will be the R dash look to the future. Straight after that, we'll go straight into question and answers. So I hope that answers that question about the agenda. 
And now I'll go over to Catherine, who is going to tell us about our year. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Lynn. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And I guess without a shadow of a doubt, uh, looking back on 2021, we cannot think of much else other than the coronavirus pandemic. And it certainly has had a massive impact, not just on us as an organisation, but on society as a whole. And whilst the impact of COVID is still affecting our organisation today, as it is most of the NHS, most of the care sector, um, there are times right now when the sense in the trust is one of real fatigue. People are tired, people are under pressure, and there's clearly quite a lot of, um, well, less resilience, let me put it that way, than perhaps we've seen in the past. But I really do want to spend a few minutes just reflecting back on what happened during COVID and to take stock of the year that we've had. And, and in some respects, it's been quite cathartic for me doing a bit of reflecting back and thinking about what happened, what we did, what we saw, what we felt, um, and reflecting on how everybody within the organisation responded. And in those early weeks of that first lockdown, we undertook some huge transformation. So as for instance, in the first two to three months, um, teams of people were actually suspended from doing their normal jobs. We were directed by um, the Department of Health to suspend certain services. So as a result of that, we then redeployed people. People were, underwent training and had to be redeployed. But we also learned a huge amount of new words and new phrases. I mean, who, who knew furlough before this uh, pandemic? But also we learned about social distancing. PPE and all of the machinations that went with PPE about the ordering, the supply, the distribution, what you wore, when, etc, etc. And we also introduced a gold command structure and Alan's just mentioned the role that Tracy played as our gold commander. And this was something that operated on a daily basis and latterly as uh, reduced to a weekly gold command. But it provided a real focus within the organisation. Everything that we needed to do in terms of responding to the pandemic was structured and funnelled through Gold Command. So you can imagine the, the huge amount of information that was travelling through a single operating model. Uh, every single day, which, as I say, Tracy uh, very ably led for us. And I, and I probably think it's fair to say we received more guidance than anybody could shake a stick at. I have never seen so much guidance arrive in the NHS in such a short space of time. Um, and we had to <laughs> we had to respond to that uh, very rapidly because, of course, you know, this was about life and death. And it was about making sure that we were protecting both our own workforce, but anybody that we came into contact with. So any one of our patients, service users, families, carers, etc. But throughout all of this, our colleagues were nothing short of amazing. People put their own health and lives at risk to care for others. We, we saw a huge outpouring of support for the NHS and incredible acts of kindness. So there's a picture forming of what it felt like in the NHS and in our dash at, at, in those early few months. But I just want to put a sort of a, a picture together for you based around a few numbers. So. Again, those early few months of 2020, April through to probably about June, we had to adopt a completely new way of working. So our health informatics people went into overdrive. They had to mobilise a workforce that could now work from home as well as be on site. And in those very early months, we saw 350 new laptop built. 
to enable people to carry on delivering what they needed to do working from home. 1,400 concurrent VPN users working in an agile way. All people connecting in from home, operating and accessing everything as though they were sat in their office. Uh, four and a half thousand MS Teams meetings that took place. Over a thousand web consultations that were provided for patients. 11 health and wellbeing rooms established throughout the organisation, again, stocked with things that the public had provided us with, so nice little goodies, but also a safe space for people to take a moment when pressure was being felt, they had a safe space to go to. We had over 20,000 text messages sent out to children and young people and their families from our children's care group, making sure that we were keeping in touch with people during the pandemic. We had 35 new student nurses join the trust during the pandemic, and we had two new executive directors join the trust as well. And interestingly enough, they've only just met the full board of directors in person in the last few weeks. And, and a really interesting uh, figure, 54% on average increase of calls coming through the IT help desk in the month of April when compared to the month before. And that continued for several months as people managed their home work life issues te and technological issues. So as an organisation and as a workforce, we showed a real ability to be flexible, to be adaptive to come together and to support one another. We had a moral purpose and arguably a common enemy in the coronavirus. And that united us as a whole organisation and dare I say it, probably even the world. But as an organisation, it felt incredibly unifying. The fact that people were working so well together, so supportive, going above and beyond what they had previously. So virtual con consultations, home visiting, changes to our standard visiting arrangements on site, all became common practice. Mutual aid, working to support partners, all of which undertaken in a heartbeat. A vaccination programme that got delivered from Almond Tree Court at Doncaster, enabling both patients and work colleagues and partner organisations to get access to this absolute game changing vaccine. And I'm delighted that just recently we clocked 21,000 vaccines that have now been delivered. And as Alan mentioned, we now start the booster programme and we're also involved very heavily in the 12 to 15 year old vaccination programme too. So it's been truly amazing to see how much actually has got delivered despite the fact that the pandemic was raging. And as I say, how people went above and beyond what was expected of them. And during all of this, we kept a real targeted focus on supporting the health and well-being of our colleagues. We know through lots of published research and from the work that we are fortunate to be undertaking with Professor Michael West, that if you look after the people that care for others, they provide better care. And there's a really snappy phrase about hurt people hurt people. And that's been a really residing uh, factor for all of us that we know how important it is to care for our people. I've mentioned already the public's response to the NHS during this last year. And we received all sorts of gifts and donations, ranging from pizzas to face masks, hand cream to Easter eggs. We were the beneficiary of Sir Captain Tom Moore and the fantastic NHS charities together. We also received smaller donations, but we, we had a, a single donation from Danny Rose of £10,000. And, and that just meant so much 
to all of us the fact that uh, somebody of a national status recognised what we were doing and wanted to uh, donate to us. And we were extremely grateful for all of that. And we were so grateful for the Thursday evening clap for the NHS and key workers. And I think it made us all feel hugely proud to be a part of the NHS. And certainly for me, when days are still tough and we're still fighting the pandemic, it really is important to remember those Thursday evenings and feeling that sense of pride. And it's important, I think, as well, for us to share with the public our gratitude for their support. We know that the public is trying to access the NHS right now and on occasion is finding that very difficult still. And all I would say to that is, you know, we are the same NHS we were last year. And we will come through this as an NHS working together with the support of our public. I'd like to reference just a couple of other things that happened alongside us responding to the pandemic. Some incredible work around discharge uh, to us to assess. This was work that for, for some years we've been struggling to get off the ground. And again, almost within a few days, if not a couple of weeks, we'd got systems and processes that were sorted that enabled people to be very rapidly discharged out of an acute setting into a much more community based and hopefully back to home. And all of that work, working alongside our colleagues in the councils, in social services, in the hospitals, in general practice, all reinforced that effort and that mutual support and mutual aid and partnership working that we've all aspired to. But we were able to actually get on and do that during the pandemic. But we also had a relentless focus on our care, the care that we deliver and the improvements that we still wanted to make to that care and treatment. And I was pleased that by the end of this financial year, we were in a very strong position with a robust improvement plan that recognised the actions we needed to address within, the, within the, the latest CQC inspection report. And I'm pleased at the progress that we've made collectively on that. We, we also had um, a really positive outturn in terms of the National Staff Survey. And, and I feel that much of the improvement was reflective of the approach that we had taken about supporting health and well-being and supporting colleagues throughout the pandemic. And it's important that, as I've said previously, that our colleagues feel well supported so that they can do the very best that they can. And throughout the pandemic, we uh, really reinforced the need for our staff networks. We have a number of networks that operate within the organisation. They went from strength to strength during the pandemic, and I'm delighted that they show real signs of uh, development and um, in just getting better and better at what they do for the future. And they're a great source of support, but also a real opportunity for us as leaders to tap into the heartbeat of the organisation through those staff networks, to hear what people are thinking, to temperature test what the mood is within the organisation. And, and they're just so uh, fantastic and so beneficial both to the organisation and hopefully to individuals as well. Um, so despite COVID, I feel as if we've delivered a huge amount. We're, I'm going to hand over very shortly to Ian uh, to talk through the finances and again to give you an illustration of what we were able to achieve despite the COVID pandemic. But finally, I just as Alan did, I'd just also like to um, register some thanks as well. And firstly, I too would like to thank, to thank Tracy, Tracy Wrench, our Director of Nursing and AHPs, my Deputy Chief Executive and Gold Commander for the last 18 months. Um, I, I don't think any of us thought when 
uh, when Tracy stepped into that role that 18 months on and she'd still be doing that. Tracy has an incredibly difficult job as it is uh, running through Gold Command uh, every single day as it was in those early days was a real test of, of Tracy's own strength and stamina. But she always did it and still does it today with such care and such compassion. And I think both personally and organisationally, we are indebted to Tracy. To my executive colleagues and to the board of directors, just thank you uh, absolutely from the bottom of my heart for all the support, for your leadership during this time. It has been an incredibly challenging uh, few, well, few, it's hardly few anymore, is it? 18 months. It's been a really difficult time. But I think that's, as I said, the, the sense of unity has really prevailed. But thank you for all of your support. Thank you to every single member of Ardash. You have been amazing. You've stepped up when we needed you to, and you have shone like the stars that you are. So thank you. And thank you to our patients and our families and carers, because you've had to show real forbearance with the NHS. We've had to learn new ways of working and you've had to respond to that. And we are so grateful for the patience that you have shown us and for working with us. And very, very finally, a massive thank you to our public. And I think your kindness and your support have really got us through this as an organisation. And my one ask was, was that you continue to support us in the way that you have during the last 18 months. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. We'll now uh, progress on to finances. And I'd like to welcome our fairly new Executive Director of Finance, Ian Carell, uh, to talk us through the financial year 2020 to 2021. Over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, yeah, fairly new Director of Finance. My name is Ian Carell. Um, I think I'm in week eight now and uh, people have been really, really kind and welcoming. So I just wanted to to, to say thank you for that, and it feels, it feels a really, really good place to be. And uh, just a shame that um, this meeting can't be face to face, but uh, hopefully I'll get to meet people um, face to face in the future. Um, so uh, I just want to give a brief, uh, brief overview of the 2021 accounts, um, and then I'm going to give an even briefer uh, forward look uh, to on the financial position going forwards. Um, I think I've been allowed five slides, so I promise I won't go on for too long. Um, so it's probably be about ten minutes, or, or just a bit less, less than that. Um, so first of all, just a, just an overview on the on the accounts. So uh, total income for the year. Um, was 179.2 uh, million. Um, and you can see on the slide there, it shows what our income was in the previous year. Um, so our income in 1920 um, went up by, by almost 8% compared to the previous year, 1920. So I think that's a really, really good increase in funding. Um, equally, we were asked to do a lot more and we delivered a lot more. So, so that funding was absolutely needed, but there was a good increase um, in funding there compared to the to the previous year. Um, because of COVID, uh, quite a few of the of the finance rules changed and how we received our money changed. Um, so we received a separate budget for COVID. Um, and where we received funding from other smaller CCGs um, in previous years, that funding was all combined with the COVID budget. Um, and we then received a separate allocation. Um, and you can see on the slide there, just, just over 4.9 million for COVID and other allocations. So that's all part of the, of the 179 million total income that we've got. Um, our main, our main funders, our local commissioners are Doncaster CCG, uh, Rotherham CCG and North Link CCG. Um, so on the slide there, you see the split by care group uh, of our total funding. And then just at the bottom of the slide um, shows our, our, our financial position in the end for the year. So we delivered a surplus of 2.247 million um, 
and that's on our income of 179 million. So that feels like a really good performance and gives a really good foundation um, as we move forwards. So um, our accounts are independently audited. Um, so, so in effect, they're checked if they're correct. Um, so our independent auditors are Deloitte um, and they give a number of opinions. Um, first opinion that they're given is that the, the, the accounts give a true and fair view. Um, and that's auditors speak for the for the, the accounts are correct and um, and say give a give give a true view of our position. Um, our accounts are prepared on what's called a going concern basis. Um, so that means that when we complete the complete the accounts, we assume that our dash will continue into the future and some of our spend can then be spread out into the future. So the auditors give an opinion on that and uh, they agree that our dash is going to continue into the future, which is good news for all of us. Um, and therefore, the, the, the we gave the correct accounting treatment of that. Um, the final uh, opinion that the um, auditors give is around value for money and they review our arrangements for value for money and they've said that um, the arrangements we've got for economy efficiency and effectiveness are good and that they help deliver value for money for, for every NHS pound uh, that we've given. So how did we spend your money? Um, so, so we spent a total of 179 million. Um, I thought a pie chart might be a good way of, of showing it. Um, so if you start at sort of 12 o'clock and work your way clockwise, so the first four segments, um, doctors, registered nursing, uh, scientific, therapeutic and technical staff, and then other clinical staff. Um, so that's all of our frontline clinical workers, and that comes to a total of 68%. So 68% of the money we get in, we spend on our frontline clinical staff delivering care. So, um, which is obviously uh, really important that, that we get money money there. Um, I would like to though give a bit of a shout out to the next segment, the non-medical, non-clinical staff. So 12% of our funding goes, goes on that, but without them, um, our clinical staff couldn't provide the care that they do. So um, that segment includes, includes our payroll teams, so without the payroll team, our doctors and nurses wouldn't be paid. Um, it includes our catering staff. Um, so without them, we wouldn't be getting the, you know, the good meals for, for our patients. Um, and it includes our estates and our facilities staff that help ensure that our staff work in a good environment and our patients are treated within a good environment. So uh, so sometimes a staff group that, that, that gets overlooked, but I say without them, and then our frontline staff can do the job that they do. Um, there's then a range of other segments um, which are largely non-pay items, but I just wanted to highlight um, those other areas. Okay, Phil, next slide, if that's okay. So capital spend. Um, so capital spend is our bigger one-off item, so not our running costs. Uh, tends to be, you know, our spend on normally on things that, that you can see and touch, and I say not, not members of staff. So uh, First segment to the right is around clinical development. So that's 1.49 million. Um, so that'd be things like ward refurbishments and giving a better environment for our patients to be treated and their staff to work within. Um, we spent 406,000 pounds on estates maintenance. So that's making sure that you know all of the all of the basics are uh, all of the basics are done. That our buildings are secure and, and work and work well. Um, and then I think probably what's a, what's an increasing area um, is the next two segments, which is around IT. So again, 1.1.496 million on on IT kit, um, and that's really helping us to get um, digitally enabled and in how we you know increasingly are, are managing what we do and how we deliver care. Um, and then a number of smaller items after that as well. So final slide from me, I just wanted to uh, spend a minute looking looking forwards um, and, and around our future future funding. Um, so I think the accounts demonstrate that we're, we're in a strong financial position. So that's really good news for, for going forward, gives a really good uh, uh, 
background for us to be able to develop and and improve our services our services um, further. Um, but um, but you know there is uncertainty and there is there is difficulty um, certainly around the public finances. So the government has. Uh, uh, a government has undertaken a, a quite significant borrowing um, that is likely uh, to, to put public spending under pressure in the future. Our hope is that health continues to be prioritised by the government and, uh, and therefore that funding is protected as we go forwards. Um, as well as national, you know, national funding might, might become more difficult, uh, equally the demands continue to increase for us in mental health and LD and community services and equally across the rest of the NHS. Um, so we're still in the response phase to COVID um, and we're also in the recovery phase from COVID and that will continue undoubtedly for many years and that will, as I say, continue to put more demands um, demands on, on, on funding for the, for the NHS. Um, I think probably more than more than in any other year, there's there's greater uncertainty around what our future funding will be. Um, we, we've actually only been confirmed funding for the first half of this year. So as we've now moved into the second half of the year, this is the first time that I've known it that, that we enter the second half of the year without actually having confirmed funding. The planning guidance recently came out and uh, and we'll be working working that through and taking our funding proposals uh, through to our board at the end of, end of October. Um, but what we really need is certainty around our future funding in, in, in the years to come. Um, so there's a spending review, there's a three year spending review uh, coming up and that will be at the end of October. Um, so the hope there is that the NHS gets a good three year settlement um, and that can give us some certainty and uh, which, which will make it better for us to better invest, uh, invest as we move forwards. Um, and the final one, just to mention the mental health investment standard, uh, that continues. Um, so the mental health investment standard uh, gives a commitment by the NHS that funding on mental health services will increase at least as fast as the rest of NHS funding. Um, so that's a really, really important commitment. Um, we still have that commitment and I don't see that commitment going away. So, so that will help protect our funding as we move forward um, as our dash. So I think that was it, Lynn, if that's OK. That was brilliant. Thank you, Ian. I'd like to now hand over to Philip Gowland, who's our Director of Corporate Assurance, and he's going to give us a roundup about the work of the Governors, Members and the Board. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us on uh, this evening. Uh, as Lynn said, my section relates to uh, Members, Governors and the Board of Directors. Um, and just do a couple of su summary statements to start with. So from our membership position, um, we, we've managed to maintain our uh, membership around 9,800, which is a, a sizable number. And I thank everybody for continuing with their membership. Um, obviously, from time to time, people leave and don't want to be a member, but managing to keep it sustained at that level is really a positive um, position that we find ourselves in at the moment. Obviously, for, for the members out there who are on this call tonight, if you have got friends and family that you'd like to also join up, um, there are ways and means through uh, and all information available on a website about how you can sign up uh, and sign up friends and colleagues as well. Thank you. Um, the second sort of overarching statement is our governors. We started the last financial year with 29 uh, governors. And again, as I said, with the members, from time to time, governors come to the end of their term or decide that they don't want to uh, continue in the role. Uh, we did have some elections back in uh, November 20. Again, quite difficult circumstances with everything that was happening at the time. But it was really good to welcome back some governors who were re-elected and also welcome some new people to the Council of Governors. And we ended that year on 20, with 24 uh, governors. Just in terms of a, sort of an overview of that, I think it's been it's fair to say, as, as we've reflected upon so far this evening, it's been a really, really difficult time in terms of the engagement and the way in which both members and governors can interact and fulfil their role. 
Um, the restrictions that were placed um, because of the pandemic really, really, really severely uh, curtail those sort of activities that we would normally have on so many fronts. But, um, but I would like to say, therefore, a huge thank you, as I think others have done so far already, to especially to the governors um, who have managed to embrace you know, new ways of working for themselves as well, whether or not it's like this through MS Teams, to ensure that they've both kept themselves up to date with what's happening at the Trust, but equally to fulfil their role. And throughout the pandemic, there were still decisions um, that the governors had to make, and it was really good that they've all managed to contribute um, across all those decisions and make sure that as a, as a function, they have managed to fulfil their role. We really look forward to getting both the governors and the members much more involved again um, in the coming 12 months, hopefully, as, as, as Alan mentioned earlier on around the fact that hopefully the pandemic will, uh, this impact of the pandemic will decrease and we'll get into a position where we can get more involvement uh, across that. Uh, just, just on the slide there, it talks about elections 2021. We're right in the midst of that at the moment, uh, with the nominations element of that has just closed. Um, so within the next uh, couple of weeks, we will be welcoming uh, eight new governors to the Council of Governors. Some are re-elections to people who've restored re and want to continue in their role. And some are brand new governors. In fact, brand new governors to, to us and, and as people not come across them before. So it is pleasing that we've still managed to attract people to the role. Um, so thank you to everybody that put themselves forward. Um, we will be in need of an election for one seat within the Doncaster public uh, uh, constituency. We will have five candidates for that. So it's actually going to be one of the most contested seats that we've had for some time, which again is pleasing from our perspective in terms of having that level of interest. Obviously, it makes it a little bit more difficult for those people standing, but um, but also we want to keep them engaged, you know, whether or not they are successful or not, we'll be looking at ways of trying to keep people engaged in that. So good luck to all those candidates and for all the people who are on the call who perhaps are Doncaster public members, uh, please use your vote. Um, the elections will start in a couple of weeks and we'll know the outcome of those in the first week of November. So before I move on to the, the next slide around the board, I just want to reiterate and re-emphasise that thought of thank you on behalf of the Trust to all the members and the governors for all your continued support. It really is appreciated. I know it's been difficult um, to be as engaged this year and want to take the opportunity to you know, learn from that and look forward to trying new ways of keeping people uh, aware of what's happening at this Trust and to give you new opportunities to be involved um, with us in the future. So I'll just move on now to um, an update around the Board of Directors. It's been touched on a couple of times already so far. Um, perhaps more so than normal, um, there were quite a number of changes on the Board of Directors in that last year. Um, the non-executive director changes, which are a responsibility of the Council of Governors, are summarised there in that first row. So they went through a process and reappointed Nigel Smith as a non-executive after his first term had come to an end. And following the retirement of Tim Shaw, who'd been with us for almost eight years as a non-executive, um, we've recruited through a process, we've appointed uh, Pauline Vickers as a new non-executive to the board and welcomed Pauline a few months ago. Now I think again, it's, it's a strange scenario to go through, not actually meeting people, but going through this sort of virtual appointment. But I think it's Pauline's adapted and has, has really took to the role. And it's really pleasing to see her uh, on the board of directors. In terms of the executive changes, uh, and I think Catherine referred to these earlier on, we welcomed Michelle Veach as our chief operating officer and Nicola Hartley as our Director of People and OD in that last uh, financial year. And just really to bring you up to speed, these were some changes that happened uh, since the end of that financial year that we're talking about. Um, Steve Hackett has moved on to another role and uh, Ian, who's been on the call already this evening, um, joined us uh, eight weeks ago in the role of Director of Finance. And just last week, we said farewell to Alison Pearson, one of the other non-executives 
uh, who, again, had, had been with us for almost eight years as a non-executive and the vice chairman. And we wished uh, Alison well. And we are currently looking for her, Alison's replacement. Um, obviously, again, it's, it's, an, it's an important decision and it's a decision that the Council of Governors will take. So uh, we, we are utilising and getting their involvement throughout the process. So that's the section. As I say, it's been a challenge keeping people involved and really enthusiastic about looking to the future and trying to find new ways of, of getting the, the governors and especially the new governors, really giving them an opportunity to, to join us and to find out much more about what the trust is about, but also about what their role is. And also to really start to improve and increase the engagement work we do with our, our members and hopefully increase those numbers as well. So we'll see how that goes in the, in the coming 12 months. So thank you very much. That's the end of uh, my section. Thank you, Phil. That was really interesting. Thank you. We now pass over, well, now pass back to Catherine Singh, our Chief Executive, who is going to talk us through looking forward and the future at Ardash. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so the future. We recognise, and I hope you've heard it from a number of us uh, today, that caring for our patients needs to be rethought. We have to think about a different way of ensuring accessible, safe and caring services are delivered. The pandemic has really taught us that we can use different approaches, that we can use digital means, but that isn't the answer for everybody. We've had really strong feedback from some parts of um, our patient and, and service user group looking at um, how we could actually deliver services in a more meaningful way for them. And we, we should not ever think that all of our services are going to be suitable in the way that we deliver them for everybody. People will want different things from our services. I think that's something that as an organisation we've got to be really responsive to and again really interested to get feedback uh, constantly on that. But we're also very conscious that the pandemic has really highlighted some, some great uh, contrasting um, issues for people and, and manifesting itself in, in really different ways. So people have been adversely affected, disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And as a result of that, we're, we're looking at how we deliver services through a different lens now. How do we address that inequality that exists within our society? And really starting to think about the differences that we can make. Um, we are working with PFG, which is a major um, membership group of peer uh, people by um, experience, experts by experience that are working with us to have a look at the ways in which we can engage and how we can use the experience of service users um, really really to best effect so that you know it's not a manager or a clinician who tells it's something that we do alongside of our um, patients how do we co-create what it is that we need to be doing for the future to really address those inequalities um, I've mentioned a lot about our workforce and w we are absolutely clear that without a workforce that feels well valued and well supported, then we do not have an organisation and we can't deliver good care. So really stepping up our focus on how we re recruit and retain and support our workforce, but how we also develop and nurture. And we're all competing at the moment. We're all looking at how we can recruit people into jobs. You only have to look at the news and the newspapers and social media at the moment to see that there are so many vacancies that we're competing with many different sectors. Uh, and we have to make working in the NHS as, 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 a, as attractive as possible. 
During the last uh, six to nine months, we've undertaken a refresh of our strategy um, and we're really wanting to reap the benefit of some of the changes that we've made during the pandemic. And the fact that we have moved so much, uh, so, so forward, so fast uh, has meant that we do need to revise our strategy. So that's that's refreshed and relaunched. Um, and it really has just reflected that opportunity, certainly that digital has provided us with, but also the fact that we can look about uh, how we address inequalities differently. So uh, you can access the, the strategy priorities and the work that we're doing on that through, uh, uh, through our comms team. Integration and partnerships and collaboration. That's a real biggie. So there's lots of uh, change coming. Uh, there's probably even more change than we were expecting coming, um, listening to some of the noise that's coming out of the Conservative Party conference at the moment around widespread reform. But there is going to be a new architecture being developed uh, subject to the passing of uh, current legislation, which is going through the government process. But we are expecting integrated care systems, care partnerships and care boards to be established from the 1st of April next year, subject to that legislation getting passed. And that means that we've got to work very differently. And, and for our organisation, we've been working very much in a collaborative way at place and across the region for many years. And whilst the landscape is changing, it won't be a huge change for us. We've worked in partnership to deliver what we need to do for years and years. And in fact, we couldn't do what we do without working in partnership. But there's a duty that is placed on organisations with this new legislation, and we will be monitored about the way in which we do collaborate. And there'll be expectations that we work with different provider groups, whether that's mental health working with acute, community working with acute, all of us working with primary care. And these uh, vehicles are being called provider collaborative. So how do we as providers work together to ensure that we're delivering a much more seamless level of care for people? And then finally, we, we do expect that we will be inspected again uh, in, in the next uh, six to nine months, potentially. I mentioned earlier that the work that we have undertaken on our improvement plan puts us in a good place. But of course, you know, the proof of the pudding will be when we're inspected and we're anticipating that that will be in the next few months. So I'll pause at that, Lynn. Um, it's, it's a quick run through of things that we're expecting to be dealing with in, in the course of the next uh, few months and, and notwithstanding what um, Ian was saying about we've not yet got the finances uh, for the second half of the year. We are still very much working our way through the planning guidance and making our expectations quite clear. So thank you. That's excellent. Thank you, Catherine. We're now going on to the question and answer session. Uh, I can see we've got attendees watching and we've got quite a few questions in already. But please, if you've got a question, please submit it now because then I'll work through them uh, and get you the answers. And as usual for events like this, we always promise to read out the question and give you the answer. If we can't answer it, we will make sure that the answer is on our website at some point, hopefully tomorrow. So to start off with, um, one of the questions is, who is Danny Rose? Danny is a local footballer. He um, is a Doncaster lad, actually. He grew up in Doncaster and he's played for England and uh, is currently playing for Premier League club Watford. So he's quite, quite a well-known local footballer. So um, hopefully yeah, that's answered that question there. And then the next question is, there's no networks for service users. All engagement appears corporately focused. Would you like to answer that one, Catherine? Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point. I mean, we are, we do recognise, I think Phil mentioned it um, when, when he was talking that the way in which we've actually been able to engage in this last 12 months is not 
anywhere near what we would like to do. I, I mentioned that we've uh, we've commissioned PFG to come in and, and work with us, and this is one of our priority areas for the future. It's a really interesting concept around uh, networks, and if we were to replicate our own staff network, so we, for instance, have um, a uh, LGBTQ network, um, what's called our DAWN network, which is our disability and wellness network. Uh, we're just about to relaunch our BAME network. Uh, we, we have a, um, a network that supports people uh, who, who have involvement with uh, the armed forces. So we've got a number of different networks where people have identified a need to come together around those characteristics. Um, and that is certainly something that I think we could explore and look at in terms of our wider engagement piece, Lynn, and uh, something that we can pick up and I'll uh, pick up with Nicola, who's our director lead on engagement. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. Now, there's a couple of, a couple of questions that have come in, our comments that have come in. Uh, one is that the pie chart was illegible. Thank you for that feedback and we'll look at that and make sure it's it's uh, a bit clearer next time. And then another comment that's come in is that please remove the watermarks from your slides. It's hard to read slides on a small tablet screen. Thank you for that. I will make sure our graphic designers remove that tomorrow morning and we'll make it a lot clearer. So the next question, it links on. In fact, I think we've sort of answered this one. Uh, the person who's put it down there, if you're not happy when I, with this answer, please let me know on the uh, on the texting in. Uh, but they're saying still waiting in Rotherham for engagement. I think Catherine's probably answered that. But please, if you're not happy with that answer, come back to me on the uh, on the typing in Q and A session. Now the next question is from someone called Mo. Thank you for getting in touch, Mo. And she said she just wants to say thanks to staff board for the hard work during COVID-19 and to Philip for keeping governors in touch and updated. So thank you for that feedback. The next question is, why can't we make this accessible? Now, I'm assuming that's the meeting that we're currently doing. And um, what I would say from a communications point of view, because I'm Lynn from the communications team, this meeting is being recorded and it will have subtitles put onto it and put onto YouTube tomorrow. So it will be available to view with subtitles. But what I'm going to do is hand you over to Phil to see if Phil's got anything else to add to that. Over to you, Phil. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I think in, a, in its broadest sense, it, it was always going to be difficult if we weren't, you know, ideally we've had these meetings before in person. We've managed to showcase some of the work that our services have done, bring, bring staff to meet members and, and the public. Um, obviously, the restrictions at the moment have not made that possible. So we've tried our our best. And I think there are probably another a couple of comments relating to the, you know, the, the slides and things like that, which we'll learn from. And we'll try and make sure all the information is, as you settle in, available on the website so others can see it. And hopefully by the time we come round to our annual members meeting 2022, we'll be in a different format, uh, hopefully in person, and we can try and make sure that this is a, a much more engaging and, and accessible meeting as a whole. Thank you, Phil. Now, we're getting more attendees join us. So if you've got any questions, we're currently on the question and answer session, please get those questions in. Because once we finish the Q&As, we will close the meeting. So please, if you've got that burning question, please get it in now and it will be asked and we will try our best to answer it. And if we can't answer it tonight, we will get the answers onto our Ardash website tomorrow. If you don't know where the Ardash website is, it's www.r-nhs.uk. Now, the next question, we have two questions that are very, very similar, and I'm going to come to you, Catherine, on this one. They're both anonymous questions, and it says, service users are also extremely tired of non-delivery. And the other question is very, very similar, and says, great that you recognise staff effort, but service user experience was ghastly. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Lynn. 
And thanks for those comments as well. And I, you know, and thanks for your honesty. I think it is really important to to reflect on the fact that this, you know, this hasn't been easy for anybody. And and as I said, you know, I know that for our patients and service users in particular, uh, this has been a really trying and difficult time. Um, so. The more we can do to hear about people's experience, the more we can hopefully do to put things right. It is really important to us that we hear from you. Um, I know that the facility is here for you to be anonymous and that's absolutely fine. But if you do feel able to get in touch uh, and if you'd like to get in touch with my office uh, tomorrow, just call the chief exec's office and, and we'll deal, you know, we'll listen to what you've got to say about your own experiences. And then we can see what we can do to either make that better for you right now or at the very least, we can start to look at how we can work on things for the future. Thank you, Catherine. And if you want the number for Catherine's office, if you want to give us a call, it is a Doncaster number. So if you're outside Doncaster, it's 01302 and then it's 796400. So please give us a ring tomorrow and uh, we'll, we'll have a chat with you about, um, about your experiences. The next question is about members. So I'm going to come over to you, Phil. And it says, can you name any actions on behalf of the members? Over to you, Phil. Thank you. Um, I think that, that's a really interesting question. And I think it does come back to some of what we said before about um, the governors working on behalf of members and the difficulties that we've had in terms of that engagement. So whilst, whilst it might be difficult to specifically say to somebody now in response, this is one particular thing that was done directly as a result of members, I think it's important to note that our members are out there all the time. Our members are part of our staff. Um, you know, our staff are our members as well as the members of the public, the service users and carers. And they may be, influencing and helping us and engaging with us in a way in which doesn't necessarily say I am a member and this is what I'm wanting but I think it's important to say that we are responsive to that as we've just talked about as Catherine has referred to you know that feedback is important to us so I'd like to think that from um, our staff our service users our carers uh, and the members of the public where they are engaging with us through various means that we are trying to respond to them and to listen to what the feedback is and to try and make overall a better experience for, for them and, and the people that they care for whilst accessing our services or whilst working here as a, an employee of the Trust. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. Now we're down to one last comment on one last question. So if you're watching this and you've got that question that you want to ask, please submit it now and we will ask it. So one of the questions is about accessibility again, saying if we can't read the slides, it's not accessible. What I will do, I'll work with Phil tomorrow to get the slides and we'll get them on our website with the recording of this annual members meeting. And hopefully then, because you'll be able to click on them and make them bigger, they should be, um, you should be able to read them. Any problems, get in touch with R Dash Communications. <coughs> Excuse me. And the email address for R Dash Communications is R Dash R D A S H dot R Dash Communications at NHS dot net. So that's R Dash dot R Dash Communications at NHS dot net. But I think once we get them on the website, and you can click on them and make them bigger. It should be it should be able to read them. So hopefully we've resolved that one. If not, please get in touch. The final question. Oh, another question is just coming. Um, the next question I'll come over to you, Catherine, and it says there's been no mention whatsoever of the community mental health service transformation. There's still nothing going on in Rotherham. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks for that question. Um, I, and I think I know who's who's probably put that question in there. So I'm very happy to uh, to speak to you outside of the meeting um, about this. Uh, but but just to say that there is a huge amount of work that's taking place around uh, community mental health transformation um, alongside of many other service transformations that are taking place. So we've got 
services, all, all factoring into the long term plan for mental health. So children, and young people services that are changing, crisis services that are changing and so on. So community mental health is one of a number of services that is transforming. Uh, we're, we're looking at some very dedicated resource into the Rotherham uh, area so that we can support this major piece of transformational work. We are working with our colleagues in the CCG. Uh, so the clinical commissioning group in Rotherham and uh, the, there's a range of things that are happening. But as I say, I'm more than happy to pick that up uh, with the individual outside of the meeting. Thank you, Catherine. The next comment that we've received is, but when we get in touch, nothing happens. I'm going to put you back over to Catherine. But what I would say is if you need to give us a bit more detail about that, by all means, please email r communications on the email address I've just given. I'll repeat it now, r communications at nhs.net. Please drop us a line and what I'll do, I'll work with the relevant director um, to put you both in touch. But what I'll do, I'll hand you over to Catherine to, uh, to come back on that one. Catherine? Yeah, thanks, Lynn. And, and just really to echo that, if if we're aware of what the issue is, then absolutely, we'll, we'll try and work with you and try and help you with that. Uh, again, if you want to come through comms or if you want to come through my office tomorrow, that's absolutely fine. Um, and we'll we'll help get some resolution to that. If if that has been your experience, then I'm, I'm deeply sorry about that. You know, I, I do expect that if you're raising issues that we will respond and that you get a reasonable response. In a, in a good time frame as well. So my apologies for that. Thank you, Catherine. The next question is for Phil. And uh, one of our viewers has said that Phil talked more engagement for members, but what's the actual point of being a member? Are we just sort of ticking a box for foundation trust status? So over to you, Phil. If I was a member, what does it mean to me? OK, thank you. So I, th I think it's fair to say it, it can mean different things to different people. Um, and I'll take it in sort of two or three levels here. So the, the first thing is that people can join as a member really just to demonstrate that bit more interest in the organisation. It could be that it's somewhere that they, someone they know works. It could be about the fact that they have used or have cared for someone that's used our services or that they live locally to perhaps some of our um, sites across the geographical area. So it could be just something as simple as they want to know a little bit more about what's going on within the, within the organisation. It can also be the pathway for, for them if they want to get even more uh, engaged and active in terms of becoming a member to then be the stepping stone to becoming a, a governor, as I mentioned earlier on, the opportunities for people to come forward and participate in that Council of Governors. Uh, becoming a member is also a requirement if anybody wants to become a, a non-executive uh, director and join the board. So again, it's it's more opportunity to get even more engaged with, with the organisation. And then I think the, 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 the final point there would be around in, in, in other circumstances and certainly in the past and as I've referred to before in the future, we will be looking for people where we want to reach out to people who are local to the organisation, who are service users and by becoming a member that helps us in terms of being able to draw from that those people, the experience that they've had, their suggestions and comments, so they, there is they get involved um, opportunity as well for those people. So I think it's much more than simply some sort of um, ticking the box, so to speak. I think people can make as much of it as they want to, right from a little bit more information through to becoming a governor or a non-executive director. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. Now, we've had a comment saying localities. What does localities mean? Localities are the areas that we serve. So that is Rotherham, Doncaster, and North Lincolnshire, and mainly it's Scunthorpe in North Lincolnshire. So I hope that helps there. The next question is also about membership. And so I'll be coming back to you, Phil. And it's, does membership reflect demographic differences in different localities? Over to you, Phil. Thank you. Another really interesting question there. Um, yeah, we are we are able to sort of analyse from from our membership um, the sort of the demographic spread across them. Uh, I think, in fairness, 
the one area perhaps where we could do more or, or, or a slightly out of balance would be around, I guess, age. Um, a lot of our members, oh, not very many, I'll say it that way, not very many of our members are what I would call younger members, the sort of 16 to uh, mid-20s. I think that would be one area where it would be really interesting in the future to be able to go out and, and improve and increase our membership from that. So that would be one area, I think, in particular. Um, there are other ways in which we can analyse it. And I think, broadly speaking, we are sort of in line with the demographic of the area in which we serve on those other, on those other sort of um, criteria. Thank you, Phil. And another statement came in, which you've just answered, and they just, obviously, we, we always promise to read out every question. And that, well, it's a statement and it says, are health inequalities rejected in membership? And I think what Phil's just answered was then, covers that one but as always if you don't think we've answered the question let us know on the uh, on the q a and um, section on this team's meeting there's another statement saying but not with service users if the person who's written that would like to give me a bit more information we can then either answer that or read the statement out the next question is about finances so i'm coming over to you ian and the the question is, Mental Health Awareness Day is coming up, it is, it's World Mental Health Day on Sunday, and we hear from across the media that mental health is just as important as physical health. Can you tell me if mental health services are equal, equally funded yet? Over to you, Ian. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Thanks for the, that's a really good question, isn't it? And I think uh, something that certainly everybody um, answering questions today feels absolutely passionate about that uh, you know it's at least as important as uh, as, as physical health services. Um, I think most people would agree that since the start of the NHS, uh, mental health services have not had the same prominence and therefore have not attracted the same funding as physical health services. I think most you know most commentators about the NHS uh, would would agree to that. Um, I think what changed. A few years ago, and I'm trying to remember when it came in, I think it must be at least four or five years ago, was something called the Mental Health Investment Standard. And before that, it was called Parity of Esteem. And what that did is it put a requirement on all the people that fund us. So there's people called uh, clinical commissioning groups. Um, it put a requirement on clinical commissioning groups to increase year on year they must now increase the funding for mental health services at least as much as they increase the funding for all other services. So they've got to do it at least as much, and many will do it more than they increase the funding for other services. Um, so that was a government's attempt to, to try and uh, to put this right. So that's been in place for a few years now. I think when I went through the slides, um, we saw that the funding in 2021 for our dash went up by 8% compared with 1920. Now, part of that is because we had new services to deliver. Uh, so, so rightly so that we got increased uh, funding for that. Um, so I think I think the summary answer is each year now our increase in funding for mental health is at least as good or better than the rest of NHS services. Have we caught up yet? I think the people on this call and their experience of services and know better than me, and I'm looking forward to learning all about it. I'm sure they will say, no, we've not caught up yet. And for many years to come, we need to increase our funding. Um, so better than it was, we get our growth in funding every year, but we've not caught up yet. Thank you, Ian. Right, we have two more questions. We have 18 people currently watching um, this event. So if you've got more questions, please get them in. Uh, we've, we've up to around uh, 20 more minutes. So if you've got a question, please send it through. Now, the next question, um, I will go to Alan, see if Alan can help us with this one. And the question is, how many of the trust board live local within the R dash patch? Can you answer that one, Alan? Yeah, I certainly can, Lynn, or I'll try to. Um, but uh, I think you'll find a great majority of the board members do. Um, uh, 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 and uh, the, the thing is that we actually cover a very wide area. 
I mean, if you consider from west of Rotherham all the way through uh, North Lincolnshire on the north side of the Humber, uh, it's quite a wide area too. Um, so a large number of the board members do live it, and some live very locally in Doncaster uh, and Rotherham indeed. So um, yes, without going into too much finer detail, I can confirm that a large amount of us do. Excellent. Thank you, Alan. Now we've got um, we've got three questions that popped up, but they're all sort of the same one. And this is one for you, Phil, and it's about health inequalities and membership. And the question being asked is, are health inequalities reflected in membership in our different localities uh, in Northern Doncaster and North Lincolnshire? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I think we, we have a way of looking at our membership and, and analysing it from different perspectives in terms of age, ethnicity, socioeconomic profiling. And I think what my comments before were that we broadly are in line with the um, analysis of our local areas when we compare our uh, membership. I think with health inequalities, and I think Catherine touched upon this in, in her presentation, we are learning because I think we are learning much more about the health inequalities across our different patches and where there are particular areas or groups um, who are uh, suffering greater with, with things like this and perhaps finding it more difficult or uh, in terms of accessing services. And I think actually it would be difficult for me to comment on whether or not we've already done that comparison, but I do think it's a really, really interesting question and something that I will take forward in terms of trying to consider that that question in itself in terms of looking at our membership and seeing how that re responds to um, the analysis that we have now, growing analysis of our health inequalities on our patch. So I think I, I thank, thank you very much for the question. We'll take that forward and hopefully try and get some, um, some substance for an answer there that will help us drive things forward in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. Now, the next question um, is, I'm going to go to Catherine with this one, but the question is, what World Mental Health Day activities are happening in each locality? Because activities always seem to be focused on Doncaster. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Lynn. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, so, Usually what happens um, around World Mental Health Day is certainly all of our um, bases, all of our team bases will, in conjunction with service users, will look to develop ideas and, and do different things. The, some, I know the person has put that it, it always seems to focus on Donny. Some of that is because of uh, PFG. Uh, so PFG are a Doncaster-based organisation and they do an incredible amount of stuff around World Mental Health Day. Um, and I think because of that and the way that they engage with the organisation, there is a predominant of activity around Doncaster, but it's more to do with PFG. Um, Lynn, I might sort of throw the question back to you as head of comms. You probably know a lot about what's going on and what activities are taking place. I don't know whether you can add anything. Um, the thing that I can possibly add is um, regarding activities, I've not promoted any activities, but I'm putting that down to we're still in coronavirus um, territory. Normally, we, our teams, as Catherine was saying, get very involved and we promote what they're doing. But because of COVID, those sort of activities have been very, very, very limited. Um, but what we have done for World Mental Health Day is one of our directors called Joanne uh, McDonough, Jo McDonough, that you probably know her as, has spoke about her own personal experiences um, about suffering from anxiety and depression. And we've sent that out to the media today, actually, under embargo to the local newspapers on Thursday, just ahead of World Mental Health Day, and to the rest of the press, such as the broadcast media, just after then, so that hopefully we can achieve some coverage. But within that, not only are we telling Joe's personal story, we're also promoting all of our three IAPT, our Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Services in Northern Doncaster and North Lincolnshire, and also, crucially in there, we've got our crisis line numbers for people who are really, really poorly. And again, in all the three areas that we serve. We'll also be pushing our Improving Access Psychological Therapies, known as IAPT for short, 
on social media and also our crisis line so that anybody that needs to contact us for that help and support, whether it's anxiety and depression or incredibly poor, they need help straight away from our crisis team, know which uh, can pick up the phone and know to call or for eye out how they can self-refer. Um, and that's all I'm aware of for Mental Health Day. So watch out for our stories, hopefully in the local press. So the next question is, can you tell me, does Ardash see its future in running more services via digital platforms rather than face-to-face. -face. Catherine, that's another one for you, I think. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, we shouldn't just assume that because we are working in a digital way that that is the answer for everybody. We, we've already had lots of feedback uh, about where digital has worked, but also where it hasn't. So I, I wouldn't say that we're absolutely thinking of putting everything onto a digital platform. But what we are keen to do is where it does work well to make sure that people have good access to it. We know, for instance, that uh, our children and young people services have really benefited through technology, not always in terms of face to face, but, but other means sort of staying in touch through social media, through text messaging and WhatsApp type uh, services is, is really, you know, cool for young people and that that's the way they want to engage with us. So what the pandemic has really showed us is we need to have a, a multifaceted approach to how we deliver care to people in many different formats and use of media. So we'll be using the next year or so to really starting to think about uh, our digital strategy. We've got that uh, already signed off by the board, but I think there's increasing need in light of the pandemic for us to, to go back over what we think is going to be important for our public, but working with our patients to find the best solutions for them. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. Now, uh, we're down to the last question again. So if any of you watching this event's got another question, please get it in now, because uh, once I run out of questions, we'll be fetching the event to a close. So just to give you a few more minutes, um, chance to get your questions in, um, please, if you've got that question, just put it in now. So the last question, as it stands at the minute, is back to Alan. And Alan, I don't know if you need to still tell me out here as well. The question about how many board members live locally and um, the person who asked it has come back saying how many that was the question and um, can you answer that one Alan? Well to be quite honest um, I've no real reason to um, I know some of our directors live locally in fact to be quite honest depending on what you refer to as local we all live locally um, so I don't think um, specific numbers make any difference to this um, I mean what I don't know what this anonymous person is seeking to gain out of these questions other than uh, probably just to create a, a little bit of uh, antagonism. Uh, we, we all work together in the NHS. We all do a fine and outstanding job as far as I'm concerned. Where you actually live is your own personal choice. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Alan. That's, uh, that's that question answered. Now that we've got one more that's just popped in saying IAPT is such a poor reputation. Um, that's IAPT, if, if you've just tuned in, is improving access to psychological therapies. It's our talking therapy services that we run across all three areas in northern Doncaster and North Lincolnshire. I wasn't aware of that, but I'll hand you over to Catherine to see if she's got anything else to add. Um, well, I agree, Lynn. Um, I'm not aware of them having a poor reputation. Again, I'll make the offer um, to Anonymous if you would like to get in touch and give me your evidence, give me your uh, experience. If you've personally accessed it, then absolutely we'll look into it for you. Um, we can only do something about it if we hear about it. So please do get in touch. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. Now I'll just do a little quick round up, round all our um, all our uh, speakers to give anybody with a last question chance to get it in. So I'm just going to go around everybody and say, what's been your highlights over that 12 month period? Over to you, Catherine. Um, I, I think for me, it's it's the way in which uh, the public responded 
the kindness that was shown and the support and that real sense of, you know, we were all in this together and, you know, and long may that be the case that people respect and value the NHS and all the good that it does and that we can deliver a good high quality service. Brilliant. Thank you. Ian, would you like to say what's been your highlight over that time period? Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, I think a bit similar to Catherine, actually, I saw in my local community, but then also my mother who lives some far, some way away, um, the way that just members of the public went and helped each other out on all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, just coming together like that was fantastic. So, so that's been great. And my other highlight has been uh, getting the job at Hardash oh. a few weeks ago. So they are two two highlights. Oh, excellent, excellent. Alan, what's been your highlight? Well, I think Ian will go far in Ardash, my goodness me. Uh, highlights, I, I, I can only echo, actually. I, I think it's the public response. Um, the, the, the pandemic was something that none of us had ever seen in our lives before. It was a total you know, total alien um, environment, um, an enormously frightening for an enormous amount of people. But I, I love the community spirit that that went through um, all our towns and villages, and we got together and we sorted things out. We started caring more for each other, which I always think is uh, is a great thing. But I do have to say. Um, uh, a great deal of thanks. I, I feel it a real privilege to be in the NHS and particularly during this pandemic and see how our staff and everybody rise to uh, the challenge of it all. They really are magnificent and um, and I, uh, I think that's probably been one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life, let alone this year. So thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And finally, Phil, over to you. What's been your highlight? I think it can uh, easily echo what has been said there by Catherine, uh, Ian and Alan. I think I'd, I'd particularly highlight the the way in which the staff responded um, to this and the challenge. I think it's, I've seen so many instances of where people have gone above and beyond and in particular just adapted to different ways of working um, from last March. Um, and I, and I, will, I will just draw attention to, as Catherine mentioned at the start, that whole digital piece of moving over that a, a, an exercise that probably would have took us significantly longer in normal circumstances, but the uh, the IT team managed to get everybody up and running in, in just fantastic speed. Um, and I think it just shows that our workforce is just fantastic in terms of being able to adapt to the change in the situation, deal with it and carry on providing the care. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. Now that's given time for two more questions to come in. Uh, the first one, I'm going to go back to Catherine. It's a comment that says digital services feel transactional. Now I know we offer so much more than digital. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Lynn. And again, you know, at risk of repeating myself, I, I, I think digital services, digital consultations are not for everyone. Um, and, you know, we, we've had that experience, we've had that feedback. Um, I agree, sometimes they can feel incredibly transactional. Um, and, and we need to we need to do more to understand how we can better to deliver deliver those services. Thank you. And last, it's uh, a comment about the BBC Bee Garden. Uh, one of our um, one of our viewers to this event says they really enjoyed coverage of our Bee Garden on BBC Radio Two a few weeks ago. And can they have regular updates about the gardens looking? The answer to that is yes. Um, the communication team is literally around the corner from the Bee Garden and we'll make sure we have regular photographs that we put into our monthly magazine, Cultural Smatters, that's available. If your staff that's asked that question, the staff get the, um, the digital copy emailed to them and for patients and the public, it always goes on our website and our social media. So we'll ensure that we do that. So keep your eyes peeled in our monthly magazine and on our social media channels. Oh, one final question has just popped in and this will be the very final one because we're running out of time now. And the question is, access to pathways seem very narrowly drawn so that target outcomes can be achieved. Do you collect the numbers for unmet need? Um, I think that might be yours, Catherine. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I totally understand the question. So, um, we we do have we do have um, 
targets that we have to work towards we do have outcomes that we hope to achieve um i'm not sure whether we would be in a position to be able to collect numbers for unmet need because if if the need wasn't presenting i'm not sure how we would know if you see what i mean so i i'm, I'm not sure I, I totally understand the question but uh, again if if that person would like to get in touch happily uh, have a chat about it um after the event Excellent. Thank you. So that is all the questions have been asked and answered. Um, hopefully you've uh, you received a, a reasonable answer. Um, we've done our best to answer them all. If anybody feels that they've not fully been answered, just let us know. Um, email r-communications at r-communications at nhs.net. Um, so, just a final roundup before we close for today, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our panel, to Ian Carell, Finance Director, Catherine Singh, Chief Executive, Alan Lockwood, our Chairman, and Philip Garland, our Director of Property Affairs. Thank you very, very much uh, to the annual members meeting. And finally, we have two ladies behind the scenes working the cameras, and it is not an easy task because we jump around at times, and that's Sue Spatter and Nikki Wilkinson. So thank you to Sue and Nikki as well for all their help. Thank you too to everybody that's attended this meeting and asked really interesting questions. So thank you and hope to see you soon. Bye. <laughs>